this gathering. Also, I welcome all the participants within India and abroad, as I was told that there are more than 700 participants from within India and abroad. India is going through a very difficult phase. On one hand, last year, our country come up with a revolutionary new education policy for education that is what we call it as NEP 2020. And immediately after that, we all are facing from last 14, 15 months to a problem globally, nationally, and particularly in the state of Maharashtra, we call it as a COVID. What exactly we are doing and how the education is becoming as a part of making the things more easier to the people, this COVID has taught us. Today, even in this difficult time of COVID, we all within India and at global level are able to listen to Dr. Yadav. This is possible due to technology. Somebody have thought about it earlier that how it can be done. The today's topic regarding sustainability and strong pillars for higher education is very similarly related to the new education policy where we come up with a revolutionary policy where we think that the five basic pillars of national education policy, that is quality, accessibility, affordability, accountability, they should come together. In our country, we talk about education, 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 quality of education, but we do not talk about accountability and affordability. We at DY Patil Group as this revolution of education in DY Patil Group, it started about 37 years back. When the founder president and Padam Siri Awardi and former governor of state of Bihar, West Bengal and Tripura, Dr. D. Bai Patil, he thought about bringing the education to the level of ruler masses, accessibility. So, DY Patil Group at present is the largest self-financed education group in the state of Maharashtra. We run more than 172 educational institutions, including five state private universities and three deemed universities. We are, we are committed towards the quality of education. In the recent NIRF, that is National Educational Institutional Ranking Framework, three of our universities are in top 100. Two of our institutions are in top 50. Why? Because we are committed towards education. We are the first group in the state of Maharashtra where private, state private agriculture university we are rolling out in June 2021. So, in association with this group today, Dr. Yadav has spared a valuable time to address us all and throw some light about what the education means. What is the quality in higher education? I still feel that education comes after dedication and hard work. In my entire life, I had learned one thing. There is no shortcut to success. I hope that today this lecture will lighten minds of people not within India, but globally. I will not become a barrier between Dr. Yadav and most of the participants. So best of luck from my side to this webinar. And I hope that this will be a great, great, great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you much, sir. Thank you.
I know you all might be eager to listen to our today's eminent speaker. His remarkable achievements and accomplishments are beyond our imagination, and one may become speechless while enlisting those. May I now request Professor Dr. Amar Singh Zadav sir, Dean R and D, and the coordinator of today's webinar, to take this challenge of introducing our chief guest and speaker for today, Padma Shri Dr. G D Yadav sir. Thank you, Radhika. So I am very much delighted and feeling proud to introduce uh, Parmasri Dr. G D Yadav sir, my. guide during my phd work professor gd yadav is one of the top most and highly prolific and accomplished engineering scientists in india he is internationally recognized by many prestigious and rare awards as an academician researcher and innovator including his seminal contributions to education research and innovation in green chemistry engineering catalysis chemical engineering biotechnology and nanotechnology and development of clean and green technology for almost 11 years he served as founding vice chancellor and arti modi distinguished professor and tata chemical darbari she distinguished professor of leadership and innovation at ict mumbai which is deemed to be university having elite status and center of excellence given by state assembly on par with the iits and iisc he currently holds the titles of emeritus professor of eminence and jc boss national fellow in ict mumbai he served as the adjunct professor at university of the saskatchewan canada australia then rmit university australia co joint professors university of the newcastle australia he was confirmed with padma shri the fourth highest civilian honors by president of india in 2016 when he was working as the vice chancellor of the icit mumbai for his outstanding contribution to science and engineering so very few personalities are there in india those have been awarded with the padma shri or his higher awards when anyone is working he has been recipient of two honorary doctorates doctorate of science from our dy patil university kolapur and doctor of in, in engineering from nit agartala as the vice chancellor he created many records in his 11 years tenure of vice chancellor in the recent november 2020 survey of stanford university where indian scientists in top 2% of those in the world are honored professor yadav is number 1 in india in physical chemistry which is within 0.2% of world scientists and which is really remarkable he is a chemical engineer but his research is in the field of catalysis science and engineering which is counted as part of physical chemistry hence he is a number 1 in india in physical chemistry as a scientist his research productivity and phenomenal with supervision of 103 doctoral fellows so it is a record in india for any engineering professor also he guided 125 master supervised 43 post doctoral fellows several summer fellows he has published more than 470 original research papers with 109 national and international patents 11 new patents applications are in process three books h index of 62 i index of 290 and citation index in journal pattern books more than 14000 and 1800 plus special lectures seminars over the years he is still actively involved in guiding 15 doctoral students patenting publishing consulting and transferring technologies to the industries he is having very good contacts with the industries so he is known as a magnet to fetch funding from the industries under his dynamic leadership ict made phenomenal progress having been declared as category 1 institute having started 23 academic programs five unit departments several center of excellence and establishment of two of campuses in bhuneshwar with total support of iocl indian oil corporation limited and marathwada in janna with total support of government of maharashtra and collected phenomenal funds the ict is listed in top 100 institutes in the developing world by times higher education ranking in 2019 the atal innovation ranking mhrd has placed the ict as number 1 among the 
government funded university he has personally won over 125 national and international honors award fellowships and several lifetime achievements awards by prestigious industry he is an elected fellow of the indian national science academy indian academy of science national academy of science indian national academy of engineering as well as world academy of science he is a fellow of royal society of chemistry uk institute of chemical engineers uk indian institute of chemical engineers indian chemical society and iist among the others he is currently president of indian chemical society and editor in chief of journal ics published by elsewhere the american chemical society acs publish special issue very on very few persons acs published special issue which is known as page scripts of industrial engineering chemistry research in his honor this 65 original research paper from scientists all over the world he is a founder president of acs india international chapter he is on the editor board of prestigious journals like acs sustainable chemistry and engineering green chemistry applied catalysis journal of molecular catalysis catalysis communications international journal of chemical reactor and engineering clean technology and environmental policy and current catalysis with a high impact factor he is a funding editor in chief of catalysis in green chemistry and engineering a big long publication us he has been member of the chair several national and international committees of mhrd dst dbt ugc aict csir and the psa on green chemistry the planning commission span india snt committee and the government of maharashtra rajiv gandhi snt committee peer groups he was a chairman of research council csir member of rc of the iict hyderabad and niict trivandrum he has served as chairman member of selection committee of directors of many csir labs he serves as independent director he is working as independent directors on five renowned limited companies arti industry godrej industry make money organics bahira chemicals limited and clean science and technology limited he is also member of apex council of indian oil and rnd export advisory committee ondc energy center oec glexon india advisory boards on process safety and the governing councils and dbt indian oil energy centers he is a chairman of dst national export advisory committee on innovation incubation and technology enterprises member of advisory and screening committee of the commission common research technology developments hubs of dsir he is a number of he is a member of the maharashtra government's expert committee on implementation of national education policy nep in 2020 He had the honor of addressing three convocations of renowned university in the India. He is the founder of literature, etymology, Sanskrit. The ICT university song is written by him only. There are fifty-seven video clips covering his lectures, panel discussion, interviews on TV, including documents on his life on YouTube. Parmasri, Doctor G D Yadav. I want to at the end. I want to tell his connection with our Divya Patil group. Parmasri Professor Dr. G D Yadav sir is basically from the uh, village Arjunwada, Radhanagri Taluka, Kolhapur. He has completed his educations in private high school and Rajaram College, Kolhapur. He played a main role to brought famous Rangkala Quarry water purification project to Kolhapur. He also brought Gokul Dairy energy conservation project, which saved more than 20 lakhs per annum of Gokul Dairy Bidri plant. Our DYP group is having strong connection with him and ICT. our dvp group and our present garden minister of kolhapur honorable satesh d patil sir supported drankala quarry water purification project in many ways and he also helped us to initiate this project his first grant felicitation after awarding parmasri in 2016 was done by dvp group and uaa ict kolhapur region chapter he is also having famous autobiographical documentary vidyanathri on youtube so i am very much delighted to invite this versatile personality who is a like uh, academic god for us who is also known as the ajab rasain in academics of india and i request him to guide the participants from all over the world just his introduction this i will uh, end with his one of the famous sentence success is autocatalytic thank you thank you one and all and i request padmasri dr g d yadav sir that to guide all the participants they are very eager to get valuable inputs listen for inputs from you thank you one and all thank you amar for this uh, wonderful uh, 
introduction it was not required but anyway uh, sometimes uh, you have to tell your audience because there are many people from across the world from different parts of india uh, so i am very delighted to address all of you on the national technology day and i deliberately chose a title called cities altias fatias achieving excellence in higher education and that's a, you know what it means is faster higher stronger okay so that was of course uh, you know this technology day was uh, started because of our success uh, in pokhran on 11th may 1998 when we had the uh, atomic testing and this was started by you know csr when uh, dr mashal kar was the director general so in the uh, in today's context we have a trinity we may call the trinity as brahma vishnu mahesh but for me this trinity change challenge and opportunity if you look at this butterfly it changes color depending on circumstances but it does not have any pigments in its uh, wings these are nano structures and they are seen when the light is diffracted or you supposing you are stuck and this is very important with reference to today's topic that you are stuck in a pace you know uh, and if you want to progress you have to leave it so you have to jump while jumping so there is a chance you may fall between these two parts the fish has to decide whether he wants to stay in a crowded place or go to a new place and so we have to take risk many times and life is full of risk so if you want to park, cross over you have to take a jump and that jump might land safely on the other side so what has happened we know for the last one year we have been living in a constantly changing world which needs materials and energy in every form to survive and progress never have so many compelling technological problems how occupied positions of prominence in our system of values every moment something happens unexpectedly posing a new challenge covid change everything as you know the way we think meet live behave or rejoice none of this was imagined a year and half ago constantly on our minds is the fear of the unknown and the uncertain future in every activity tiny creature you may has held the whole world world to ransom with devastating effect so the trinity is change challenge and opportunity challenge contains the word change also so every challenge brings a change and the so called national education policy is meant to achieve excellence in academic world and that will transform india so whenever we have an opportunity and this is the opportunity where we can say excellent education should be at the forefront to transfer our society so what are the major national and international issues and no matter which newspaper you read or which tv channel you watch these are always there and they are related to energy environment water affordable health care and food and we are talking about carbon footprint so called net zero infrastructure sustainable development gdp everything is there so when we are talking of education and higher education for that matter because that is what i'm addressing uh, these issues will always be there no matter whether you are a humanities or you are a social scientist or you are a you know a basic scientist or engineer and in this regard the 17 sustainable development goals come to the fore and in that quality education is very very important so we must question ourselves are we providing quality education to our students and are we doing our job you know very religiously so the cities ids fatias i would redefine here that if with reference to your own organization wherever you are serving whether it is a college or university dim university or whatever your own department because you might have been attached to some department or a center and your own role 
and so all stakeholders must try to catch up with the very best in the business so this is what is the cts ips 40 years the title which i chose for so what it means you must know your role in achieving the excellence so let us look at the key principles of the national education policy what does it say i now particularly you know encircle uh, this some of this continuous review to build on sustained research and regular assessment by ed educational experts this is very very important so like we have the nac and the nba and whatever okay so we have to have some review who is doing that review then what the important thing there are we giving education to make our students think critically and creatively and this will lead to boosting of logical decision making and innovation very important for country like india respecting diversity and local context to be reflected in all our curricula pedagogy and policy this is very important and to achieve excellence we have to make use of technology in teaching and learning and removing the language barriers so you can study this thing in any language but but that effort has to be done by the education minister so let us look at the social progress index ranking in 2020 see country like india you know this uh, this is united states is somewhere at 28 look number 1 is norway united states 28 24 is uk 20th is uk india is 170 so we have to make a lot of progress and this is where quality education is going to play a role so the prosperity is related to these parameters like the social capital personal freedom safety and security health education governance and entrepreneurship and opportunity in prosperity index india is 101 we were 104 5 years ago 114 rather 140 so you see that educational excellence is what i'm going to talk about and if you look at the so called prosperity index this is 2020 chart you see india is 101 denmark is number 1 norway is number 2 usa is number 18 so and if you look at the world competitive ranking you see at 2019 and 2020 singapore singapore is number 1 and believe me singapore has the best educational universities they were nowhere but the government gave them tremendous support and they were brought in the top 10 so you see india still remaining at 43 the world competitive index china is 20 so yes we have to go miles ahead in this and this is where we must look at the growth projections by the region see the what will be this is the world economic outlook in april 2021 this was published what is believed by 2021 we will have this is a projection 6% or 4.4 the gdp growth look at here it is usa it is said it will be 6.4 and you see all other countries shown over here i uh, and so in the emerging and developing asia it is 8.6 and it will be 6 next year so where does india stand in this particular case so you see in the economic growth here is india india is in that 6% bracket and so this is on the basis of the projection was based on no corona virus okay with corona virus and there is a pandemic so you can see with pandemic which have gone down we have gone down so we have to be and so can the institute add to the national exchequer here is the next question because this is what i'm talking about if institutions cannot generate jobs they cannot add to economy because universities are the engines of economic you know power so look at the most innovative economies in the world germany south korea singapore israel france we don't find any place over here here on the look at the countries where uh scientific publication india is number 3 so it's very good it's about 5.31% china is number 1 that means they are doing a lot of research and innovation so this is what the universities are supposed to do that so luckily this is what the innovate india there is a india has literally 
you know, jump from position 81 in 2015 to something like 48. So this is very good. That means Indian government policies are helping in innovation. So who are these people? Who are these stakeholders in pursuit of innovation and excellence? And I'm going to talk bit by bit. Remember, excellence begins with openness to new ideas, irrespective of the origin or who the generator is. It, it does not matter who is giving the original idea. This, this is very, very important. And that happens because you have a freedom. Okay. So, so the great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. That is what Herbert Spencer had said. Okay. So okay, there are also enemies of excellence. And there is a beautiful novel written by this Greg Salsicoli. You know, and these are the four pillars of excellence. Okay, you know who they are. So count yourself in this ladder of success or failure. This is number one. Whether you are a faculty member or non-teaching staff or a student or alumnus, count that. Next is do not blame the unknown or perceived as your enemy because this is what happens many times in academic institutions. You think that the head of the department is the enemy or the principal is the enemy or the management is the enemy and they are not allowing. No, if you there is enemy, you are the enemy if there is one because you have not, you know, exerted yourself. You are not taken, you know, advantage of the opportunities provided. So if you want to be excellent, no matter whether you are an institute or an individual, these are the pillars. Firstly, competence. You must have a competency. Then you must be passionate about it. It, it does not happen. Unless you are passionate about something, you won't be able to achieve it. And for that, you must be committed. Have commitment. Then there may be some source of inspiration. And that source of inspiration may not be near by you. Somewhere may miles away. That could be a source of inspiration. You must have motivation to do something new, different. You must have ideas or you have to generate ideas. And you have to, these ideas must lead to innovation. And you have to communicate these ideas with your fellow workers and your management. And therefore, above all, you must have a new vision. What is, you know, excellence? This Aristotle said several years ago, what we do every day repeatedly is excellence. And then it becomes a habit. Okay, that is what Aristotle said. So you must have a craving for excellence. And they must be all of them. So who are these in building institutions in higher education? Of course, the faculty, the quality of faculty, their diversity, the students, again, the quality of students, their diversity, their genders, the support staff, the alumni who are the torch bearers and the board of management. So the board of management, they will be overseeing all these things, but they have a very, very important role in promoting higher education. So. What it means, this is said by Confucius, the will to win, the desire to succeed, the urge to reach your full potential, these are the keys that will unlock the door to personal excellence. And every one of these, these stakeholders must have that desire to excel. So, and of course, I said in that previous slide, there is a source of inspiration. So you may have any source of inspiration. And then Einstein has famously said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. What it means, you may be good at something, so concentrate on that rather than doing something which you cannot do. So you have to know your limitations, your strengths and weaknesses, so that you do as an individual, as an institutional, and you can do it with reference to a nation, national goal or international goal. So yes, of course, and today's world is a digitally connected world. The means of achieving excellence have changed what you used to do before, you know, during the Gurukul era. And so you must have a perspective. Unless you have a perspective in your own area, in your own department, in your own institute, you cannot get excellence. So what are the 21st century skills required? Okay, these are foundational literacies competencies and character qualities. You see that literacy, numeracy, scientific literacy, ICT, this is, uh, you know, information and communication technology, financial literacy, cultural and civic literacy is very, very important. We might be literate, 
but we are not culturally literate or we don't have civic sense. That is another problem. Then you must have the critical thinking or problem solving ability, creativity, communication, collaboration, what I said before, and curiosity. The student must have a curiosity. The professor must have more curiosity than the student. And somebody has to take an initiative. It starts with this professor and also the students. There must be a persistent, there must be a grit. You must adapt with the new thing, like I showed you the butterfly before, leadership qualities and social and cultural awareness. These are 21st century skills. So then you mark a benchmark, what you want to achieve. Supposing you are number 100 first year, okay, in the international ranking, can you go beyond uh, less than 100, 99, 98? So why not aim 50? Then somewhere you will get. So how do you do that? That is very, very important. So maybe uh, you have a reference. It could be a local, national, or international. Uh, if you are a superman, you can fly in the air. So the international reference, uh, we can ourselves compare with MIT or Berkeley or Oxford or Cambridge or we compare ourselves with the local universities or our institution. So what is the reference? That is very important. So institutional excellence is built by a combination of many, many things. And how do you attain this institutional excellence in a digitally connected and instantly accessible world? Mark my words, instantly accessible world. And what is the role of the stakeholders in pursuit of excellence? And how do you sustain this excellence? Like supposing you go to the apex of the point, it is very difficult to stay there because it is a metastable state. Number one position is a metastable. You can fall and go to number two or go down, but okay. So this is where you have to redefine your vision and mission. And every stakeholder must have a vision and he must have, he or she must have a, a mission. So, so this is where I would like to quote Susan Hockfield, the former president of MIT, the first lady president. She was a medical doctor, okay? And what she said, universities are the engines of economic growth. That means universities can contribute to the national exchequer, the question which I had asked before. So what she did, she was the most successful fundraiser for MIT in their history, $3 billion she generated. In cross disciplines, departments, schools, within the MIT, and she fostered collaboration among Boston's regions, academic medical centers and educational institutions. So she did not say that, okay, MIT is the best, so I should keep quiet. No, she went beyond that because she knew that in today's world to succeed and to remain successful, you require collaborations. So she went beyond the brand MIT, okay. So this is where some statistics will help you. Okay, so this is what the GDP of United States, this is 2018, you know, uh, statistics, I could have updated it. So in 1970, India, China, and USA were not far different in the GDP in trillions of dollars. Okay, you remember. And that time, Indian rupee were, and the US dollar was about four or five uh, rupees. So it was not much. And in 2018, U.S. economy, GDP is $19.39 trillion. China is $13.35 and India only $2.71. And our prime minister says we should be a $5 trillion economy by 2024. So who is responsible for this increase in, in, in GDP? Okay, is it the government? So you see, there were two tipping points in this, in the case of USA. In 1973, when the oil embargo was there, and 1994, 95, this should be over here. This is when, you know, the biotechnology revolution took place. These were the two tipping points when maximum innovations happened in technological world, okay? So what happened and where did it happen in the United States? One was in the West, okay? That is the Silicon Valley and another in the Boston, the Gene Town solving problems of national and international importance and creation of wealth through open door policy. They had open door policy. They invited students from across the world. In our country, we don't want students from the neighboring you want district. Our universities are so parochial. We don't want students. So this is where the open door policy is one of the most important parameters for success of America. So look at the two great universities, Stanford, with a surface area of 33.1 kilometers square 
and MIT is only 0 0.68. And you see the contributions to technology there. $3.8 trillion, MIT, Stanford graduates, 3.2 trillion by MIT graduates. And total uh, uh, economy was, nine, GDP was $19.39 trillion. So almost one third of the GDP was created by technologies developed by two universities. What it means that behind every innovation hub lies a great university. Are our IITs doing that? Are, are, are our central universities doing that? Are our state universities doing that? And if they are failing in that goal, what is the reason? We must find out. So remember, a university is not a collection of buildings and affluence of facilities, but of inspiring and great teachers, innovative students, supportive alumni, and dedicated support staff who are active and vibrant participation, participants rather in the creation and promotion of new knowledge and innovation. So we revere these universities, whether it is MIT, Harvard, Stanford, UC Berkeley, University of Chicago, or Caltech, or Cambridge, Oxford, ETH Zurich, and on the Eastern side, we are National University of Singapore. So what do we learn from them? Why are they so much revered and what is the magic for their success? What lessons can be learned by Indian, you know, higher educationists? Do Indian university have the desire and capacity to, to go be like that? And how do we do capacity building? And what is the role of government? These questions we must ask, and I'm going to provide some of the answers in my lecture. One very important thing is the governance, leadership, and management. How we are doing that? Because there are a set of rules. There are university rules, private university rules, dim university rules, NITs, IITs, name it, central university. So to achieve excellence, you need to have a very supportive and progressive management. You know, formula number one. Because there are wheels within wheels, and even if one of them malfunctions, the, 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 the vehicle won't go to the next car. So, and so in this case also, so there she needs a very good leadership, and I'm going to talk about it a little later. So what are the barriers for universities or academic institutions to go to the next level? What are those barriers? The lack of meritocracy. Maybe somebody else who doesn't deserve become head of the department. Or the management instability. The management is fighting. There are two groups. One fights against another, which is very common in India. Or there is high politicization of that management. Or there is a lot of bureaucracy. The decisions are not taken for days or months. And there is centralization. Only one person decides nobody, he doesn't listen to anybody. And there are a lot of beliefs in, in misconceptions pursued. And, and, and this is a paradoxical management. These are some of the problems where the head of the department does, is not able to function, or the vice chancellor is not able to function, or the dean is not able to function because these things happen. And so this is where. And there is a lot of psychopancy also. Sometimes somebody becomes, you know, head of the department because of his closeness uh, to the authorities. Okay. And sometimes you find psychopancy in the students also. You know, the students will praise the worst teacher day as their favorite teacher, you know, so that he gives more marks. That can also happen in system. But what is that system? System receives ideas. There are different people and there are different outcomes. So when you have a state funded institutions, are you have a central funded institutions, are you have a private institutions, I have deliberately shown different boundaries. Some of them are very porous, flexible, some of them are highly rigid, and some of them are manipulative. I'm not going to go into the details of that. You know from your own experience, whether you are attached to a state university, a central university, or private university or college, you know what is that system. Okay, that is what, and so that there may be well-defined rules in somewhere it is all ad hocism. That can happen. So if you want to make uh, excellence as a, so it is not a habit, but in an act, as, I, as Aristotle said. So it takes practice and perseverance. So there has to be a systemic excellence, there has to be individual excellence, and there has to be institutional excellence. And I'm going to tell you some mantras, how to achieve it. So one of the important things, these are three important things rather, is the freedom to practice. So you must have a vision and mission and a strategy for innovation. Then there must be well-defined processes and practices and systems in place. And there has to be a prevalent culture of innovation. And that cannot be built overnight. So that means you have to recruit very good people from across the 
world now because of the new policy, you can recruit people from across the world. So first thing, you know, is so-called autonomy. In Indian system, there are so many colleges which are attached to university system. And the worst college and the best college are graded by the same system. So you do not know the excellence of the college. Only you get a degree, BA, BCom, whatever, from that university. And then within the university, there are different grading. So autonomy is one of the most important parameters in, in achieving excellence. So what autonomy should be? It is openness, there is a transparency, and there is a lot of integrity of those who are running that institute. So this is a good governance practice. And then you evaluate the performance and you can reorient yourself depending on your objective. And you must have collaboration with all stakeholders, outside agencies and whatnot. And this is where once again, leadership matters. So what, you know, autonomy, technique made it possible for many deserving institutions in India to be autonomous. And national education policy, many things have been borrowed from this technique exercise, you know, textbook experiment. So autonomy allowed to set a new vision. The vision means tomorrow, mission is today, and values. And these values must conclude inclusiveness, participation, quality, and openness. It's very, very important. This is, uh, this is the triangle on which autonomy rests. So autonomy enable to keep track of valuable data and statistics to compare performance in all areas. So MIS, the management information system is the best thing because it is you know, computer generated uh, system, you can, uh, you can make use of it. So creation of infrastructure, research grant, fellowships, all those things were possible. Like ICT benefited by this. If I give an example of ICT, ICT became separate from Mumbai University, became autonomous, became the university, and TechWip made it possible for us to go to a higher, you know, echelon. So NEP 2020 talks about it. So autonomy is the beginning of a never ending journey of discipline, hard work, and the pursuit of ever higher standard. So it is just a beginning. Autonomy does not mean the end. And autonomy brings a lot of responsibility on all stakeholders. So one of the things, what happens in autonomy, in the public funded institution, there is always a fear of the so-called RTI, okay? So if you, if you say that RTI is the one which will expose you or sometimes people make use of RTI to threaten you or, or exploit, so you know, that kind of thing. Every decision, document and action can be questioned in a public funded institution and there could be controversy. So uh, the best policy is using minimal words in the minutes of meeting because every word the lawyer will earn extra thousand rupees, okay? So keeping away from the controversial issue and words cannot spoke about, not spoken cannot be printed or misprinted and everywhere it is the decision of the committee and not of the individual because whenever we have committee it is the decision so somebody says he doesn't agree with he can uh, have his dissent there in the minutes but once the minutes are published he is party to that he cannot say tomorrow that okay i, I do not agree with that decision then he should have said it so this is what happens in so autonomy brings responsibility. And when we want to be autonomous, you can see the majority of the people, colleges, we know that they are, they are afraid of getting autonomy because if they are quite capable, they can go and land in a beautiful world, new world. Otherwise, many of them will fall and where did it land? That is the issue. Autonomy brings responsibility on all stakeholders. And why autonomy is enjoyed by academicians? particularly the academicians in many colleges and universities, and particularly the unions of non-teaching staff, they don't like it. They think it is a step to privatization of loss of job and perks. This is where everywhere there is a misconception and the unions are notorious for this, the propagating this falsehood. Inadequate knowledge of administrative powers of authorities. That is another problem in autonomy because you have to be responsible. And many times the lucky to be head syndrome, somebody becomes head of the department, he says, I don't want any problem for three years, okay? Let me run it as it is. He doesn't want to take any responsibility. And many times in these cases, there are plans for post-retirement benefits or extension of services from the government. So no controversial decision is taken or no 
uh, many times the authorities do not challenge the government decision. The Babu gives some decision which will be detrimental to the institute. They don't stand for it because they are looking at post retirement benefit. This happens in many, many institutes. Fear of antagonizing bosses or super bosses. And the many things which happen in India by this policy, no decision is the best decision. It was said about a very, very famous politician. Okay, so autonomy, so many times there is an arrogance on the part of academicians. Okay, they say I am PhD, therefore I am more knowledgeable. Nonsense, it is not correct. And it is not true that because you are PhD, you are much smarter than the politician. The politician may be smarter than you because he has also gone through some rigorous uh, training and, and grill. And many times in the autonomous institution, there is a fear of political interference and pressure. And authorities succumb to pressure. That is the problem. And politicians, you know, they are as smart as you are, and they are, uh, know their dangers of action. So, for example, suppose a politician is a boss and he tells you to do something, and you tell uh, privately, sir, this is not correct. It will expose you, and it will expose me, and it will be bad. He will not ask you to do it. But normally, the politician doesn't ask. It is his OSD, so called, uh, you know. Uh, officer on special duty. He could be his relative or a party worker or somebody or a PA or PS, he will call. And in fact, he becomes most powerful than the minister himself. The minister may not know. Okay, the minister may not know and you, you will do something and the minister will land in problem. So I must tell you this, my own personal experience. If you tell honestly your opinion that this is not good for the institute or good for you, the minister will never ask you to do wrong thing. Okay, that is that is the truth. But people don't do it because they want to get some favor. Tell the truth politely to authorities and the dangers of the wrong decision, they will respect you. In fact, they respect you more when you tell them the honest thing in a polite manner, of course, not in an arrogant manner. Now here comes the ranking as a yardstick of excellence. We are a ranking by you know the Times Higher Education ranking or the QS ranking. And everybody wants, there is a reference, right? And everybody wants to climb the ladder. Okay, the last year's ranking and this year's ranking. And so we must understand what are those yardsticks. So what is your yardstick of your comparison? Okay, your yardstick may be, supposing you are a tiger and your tiger is always better than a cat, right? This is your reference is cat, so you will be better. But then you are forgetting there is a lion also, right? So what is your yardstick? The yardstick must be defined. So your yardstick is to be superior to somebody across the world rather than superior in your own institute and with a reference to another department, you won't achieve that excellence. So if you look at the past performance of your college or university, you must have dedicated and accomplished faculty. There must be a spirit of entrepreneurship, whole generation entrepreneurship. And you should be cited as the best example of academia, and industry and government relationship. There must be talented students coming from all strata. This is the inclusiveness which NEP is talking about. There is a spirit of innovation among faculty, students and alumni. There is an industrial consultation that is practice what you preach and industrial internship by faculty and students. Very, very important. Remember, you know, this is, uh, you know, it is not that only the science and technology faculty members can do consultation. In United States, 10 to 15, rather 15% 15 of startup companies are started by faculty from humanity. So you can see, so universities are harbingers of creation of new knowledge. This knowledge must be student-centric, job-oriented and entrepreneurship focused, and that knowledge should be cutting edge knowledge. Sometimes you may generate incremental knowledge. If knowledge which is disruptive leads to more innovation. So dissemination of this new knowledge to all stakeholders, particularly the unbelieving students is a very, very important thing. Remember every university must have innovation as their central mantra and that must guide their university education. And obviously this has to serve society at large. So societal development, every segment of society must be at the core of this innovation. Of course, the traditions and public perceptions win half the battle as far as the ranking is concerned. So what can we do in India to be ranked across the world? The institution of eminence was started with this objective. So looking at the best performing universities and deriving inspiration from them, then you can create adjunct professorship. 
where you can have professors from industry, professors from industry, professors from abroad also. Bringing at least 10% of the state university by MHRD, you know, uh, Department of Education. So this, you know, my personal belief, people may not agree. According to me, 10% of the state university should be fully funded by the center, okay? Uh, although stay, stay education is a concurrent subject. Supporting libraries and accessibility to database to everybody. In fact, there was a committee appointed by DST to see whether open access journals should be subscribed and people should have access all students and researchers in India. Removing the barriers on recruitment of faculty and students. In the case of private partner universities, it will not be a problem, but in the, the government funded institution, there's a lot of barrier on recruitment of faculty. And one of the important things is giving industrial sabbaticals, whether it is summer, semester, term, in local industries and beyond. And local industry for particularly because India is a great big country. So wherever there are industries, you must serve that local industry and develop some sort of rapport. And of course, one of the very difficult problems is recruitment of faculty of high caliber and asking them to do postdoctoral research in famous laboratories and universities abroad. And then international collaboration. Remember, strength begets strength. No strong person will have collaboration with weak. So you have to start in phases. Okay. So ranking and promotion of quality in India is given by NAC, NBA, NRF, and ARIA now, the actual ranking, the institution of eminence. Then there is a so called graded autonomy. So ranking is here to stay like Ada. Okay. Ranking will stay. Somebody doesn't like it. You know, I have heard many vice chancellors of very famous universities, old universities saying that, okay, we don't care for ranking. Ours is a very old university. We don't fall in there. Oh, that is nonsense. You can't say that because you are living this new world. So what it means, ranking parameters, every, you know, ranking agencies have different weightage. So faculty and its diversity is one important parameter, even in NRA. Students and their diversities, where are they coming from? The quality of faculty and students, and there is a catch-22 syndrome. That is, unless you're good faculty, you don't get good students, and unless you're good students who can do research, you don't get good faculty. So it's a catch-22 syndrome. Then there is a spread and diversity of alumni. The alumni must be spread across the globe. Then only it will bring name and fame. Then you must have high access to, access to rather high-end facilities. Then the research output, which is given in terms of statistics on patents and publications. And of course, the quality of support staff. Support staff must also be good for doing research and supporting the research facility. And remember, last but not the least, PRO. You can be in the, you know, in the eyes of public for doing something wrong. And see, one of the famous universities in, in India is always in the eyes of the public, not for their good quality research, but for the wrong reason. So PRO matters a lot. So suppose we want to rank and it is just leave to public perception. Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, MIT, UC Berkeley, Princeton, Stanford, you assume they are very good. And the old universities like Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, JNU, Delhi, and you are a new university. Where do you stand? Where does your department stand? And what about you as an individual in that particular discipline? What about IISC or the new brand ISERS? What about the new IIT? Who created it? Whatever name you, you may call IIT Dharavi tomorrow, for example. So is it the same as the old IIT? Who created the IIT brand? And NIT, when NIT is you know, partly funded by states and, and, and now they have all become central university, uh, their central deemed university rather, and uh, they have given a lot of funding for research. So if you look at this, very interestingly, sometimes, you know, in the, in the ranking by times higher education, 40% uh, weightage is given for public perception. So if you say Oxford, you will always believe that it is a great university, right? So once there was a question asked, you know, uh, what about the, uh, the water ma uh, management department of Harvard University? There is no water management department, but everybody cited that as number one. So that can also happen, okay? So brands are not created overnight. Brand name and hence perception can be misleading. And the brand, old brand makers do not like the new kids, like the new IITs and the old IITs. The old IITs, 
you know, professors don't like the new IITs. They take uh, making use of their name. So perception is uh, by this definition is being in the eyes of the public, whether good or bad. Okay, and it is not necessarily related to excellence, but being in the media. So it's a bad idea. So in fact, I wrote to an I an I a couple of years ago. I said, don't have this public perception in the ranking because it is hardly 0.1% on 0.2%, you know, somebody is up or below. That is not a good idea for India, but yes. So with the NRF ranking, so liberally look at what happens. The centrally funded institutions, SCFI, they, they should be definitely liberally funded to create Indian brand. But why are you neglecting others? What is the, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 the problem with the uh, state university, why they are neglected, why the state monopoly treatment is given to state university. Okay, what is their fault? And so in the global ranking, look at the yardstick, you know, what is one of the yardstick, how many global laureates you have on your uh, faculty? How many faculty are derived from across the world? Many of the universities in India may not have it. And in fact, precisely that was the reason this NRF was created. So state funded and private institutions, the correct status and quality of education, and ultimately we are talking about the gross enrollment ratio, GR. Are we looking at the quality? Can we create say 70% of higher education, GR will have quality. So this is very, very important. And I already told you about, this is where once again, the variable weightage is given to different parameters. So these challenges for state funded institutions, Recruiting the best and retaining the greatest uh, uh, is the greatest holder rather. And we have to remove ban on recruitment and states are not doing enough to, to ensure quality. Head becomes the subservient uh, to, uh, to the bureaucracy. Many times the vice chancellor is sitting outside the bureaucrats, you know, PA's office and it is pathetic. This happens only in India. It will not happen across the world. And family, in fact, uh, you want to have the best of the faculty. These days, both husband and wife are well qualified. So the spouse must also be recruited. So either in your own organization, somewhere else, and you have to also think of the kids and their education. Then only you can recruit good faculty. So from PG to PG is the mantra for recruiting good qualified faculty. And of course, avoiding the political interference and raising the bar. In, in recruiting faculty, very, very important for government institutions, okay? And we know the funding by the state government is dismal in comparison with the CFI. So for the state uh, the, uh, universities have a function, uh, a question of survival. Excellence is their least power, uh, priority. That is why you will never find in the NRF a lot of say, state universities. That is hardly you will find any. So, so the, what is required uh, by the university system, national policy and state funded university and institutions, this is where we require a lot of uh, innovation. Okay, so the affiliating system and overburdening of vice chancellor with frivolous issues. Okay, he always does the firefighting job. And many times you will see that the vice chancellor is every day in the news. I don't know by hook or crook he's there. He will, I used to get uh, somebody used to send me you know, a lot of these pictures every day. I, I just asked him once jokingly, hey, how come you are there always in the news? What are you doing there? So that means he wants to be in the news, not, not because of a leadership, but for some uh, problem. So creation of national or state level roster of academics at entry level or vice chancellor, director, level. this is one solution. So that there will not be any corruption, good people will be selected. And so this choice of the leadership should, should be from the school. And so at the same time, then this question will not be asked, is the vice chancellor as inspiring as a leader? And can the vice chancellor live by example? These are ex examples. And what are the opportunities for universities? Involving industry who need to be given tax benefits under section 35 of IT Act, as well as CSR, corporate social responsibility. Uh, so finance ministry and education ministry, in fact, I gave a talk once in Niti Aayog on this, and I said, instead of 2%, make it 3% and spend 1% on higher education. Of course, nobody listened, but I'm telling you that I have given a talk like this. Then we have this institution of eminence and global ranking. Why only 20? Initially five, then plus one, then in a green field. Why not 50? What is the 
crime the other universities have done are they not as good so this is this is where government goes wrong at least top 50 should be funded by center and taken its under its umbrella like and we have references uh, we can compare them with china korea singapore finland where this is actually happening so university branding is a very big mission for universities which are small do not have money but need to be you know research oriented innovation oriented university one of the things which matters a great in university is undergraduate research if you do not have post graduate program you can start with undergraduate research then you can have cross disciplinary research in many times in this regard it is better to abolish departments and create centers of excellence and you have cross appointments okay so one person can be member of three four centers so and this is where technology be must be used in every sphere of activity again when you compare yourself with the leading global university is funding along the problem answer is no what about the quality of research what about ipr generation intellectual property right of innovation and i will give some examples on ipr can you create and maintain the infrastructure can you create the state of the art facilities to attract high quality faculty is there a easy access to leading databases research patents reports attract and what about you know government i uh, you know about 4 5 years ago refused to support public funded databases even to institute like ict and the e resources will be so this will be counterproductive so in place may pindas and all these databases must be available to everybody including private institutions if you want to become in the, you know globally competitive university so this is what and so universities so when you want to have a research excellence you must concentrate on your core strength which is sectoral strength and the novelty okay then you must have the contemporary subjects and connect it with, with industry or its application must be defined and of course you have to teach cutting edge subjects you must have a lot of visiting faculty you take help of the local strength there may be local industry there may be local you know other colleges industrial application but few with academic points because every problem need not have industrial application it could be your academic research but it may have it may generate something in future and this is it, this is where it will lead to generation of ipr and then you can compare yourself with international leading universities and you may be competitive then you may have local departmental universities state national whatever what it says think globally and act locally our graduates are going to serve the world tomorrow today it may not be so we have to solve the local problems but we may have perspective of the international so what happens if you want to increase the impact and citation of the research promote multidisciplinary work in your so chemistry chemical engineering material science you may have mathematics also promote multi institutional work okay like for example dy patil have many colleges and different university why are they not doing this multi institutional work involving multinational work and i already mentioned strength bigger strength a cutting edge temporary contemporary research then you have foreign trained faculty members so what it means that you send your faculty for post doctoral studies abroad for 3 months 6 months etc there are many opportunities provided by the central government dsk ugc etc and then you can create a pool of teachers from research institutes who propagate your idea you know for example professor cnr raw john white said robert langle they have created so many students who have propagated their idea and in fact obviously they will have high citations and high impact across the world having students from different countries and regions is the best strategy for increasing your impact and of course you have to avoid inbreeding that does not mean that you should recruit your own student but they are if they are trained abroad sometime learn something new you can recruit them that is what we did in ict but that need not be the mantra okay so the factors which are responsible for institute branding and reputation at national and international level are the reputation of alumni international standing of faculty promotion of research and innovation culture industry sponsored project industrial consultation quality and diversity of students government support placement record and in today's world placement record matters a lot then financial help to needy students organization of international conferences national recognition to teachers and students international recognition recognition technology transfer a development and transfer supports the participation service to society and public perception these are the factor for ranking responsible for ranking 
and i'm giving you two great examples that is ipr is wealth robert langer okay and george white said look he has an h index of 287 3 40000 citation and uh, and he has 40 startup companies more than 1400 granted or applied patents 220 plus major awards he is the most cited engineer in the history of and the fourth most cited individual in any field having authored over 1500 scientific papers and is also a prolific entrepreneur having participated in founding of 40 biotechnology company including modern other vaccine which you are talking about is robert langer's company and on the other end we are george white sites of harvard university 130 per patents 1500 plus papers citation look 350000 h index is 269 i10 index is 1432 and white sites has co founded 12 companies with combined market capitalization of 20 billion dollars and the names are genzyme jeltex theravans surface logics nanoterra and wmr biomedical He has mentored more than 300 graduate students, postdoc, more than 200 postdocs he has graduated, mentored. Imagine these are billionaire professors. That means they have converted their ideas into economics. And so, you know, White said had visited ICT a couple of times, and he had given a lecture also. What he says, universities are supposedly set up to incentivize, that is, to reward creativity, good teaching, daring, intellectual daring. running counter to convention so white sites is great because of that and what he also said corporations are basically set up to legally to return stock stockholders put in money and the corporation is supposed to do back more money okay so so if you look at the importance of a, a intellectual property rights in universities you must have a position of dean research innovation and translation this third word translation is very important then the ip ownership and licensing or empowerment is a business strategy for some other than the products themselves so first enabling technology in nearly a century where fundamental building blocks are being patented and the cross industry ownership of patents this is what is happening in industry so universities and institutions own significant number of ip in united states so which is not happening in usa so what is the benefit of patents it stimulates further research encourages innovation and investment and prompt commercialization of inventions and many things happened during this covid covid period in india for example this bharat biotech is a startup company from uh, from uh, india which is supported by uh, department of science and technology in db so it will foster exchange of information help avoid duplicative research and increase the general pool of public knowledge a patent gives also very interestingly a negative right not to uh, the right to use the invention so many times people have more patents only 90 uh, only 2 to 3 percent patents are used 98 percent are percent patents are used to block somebody else's entry into that area so patents have territorial limitation and uh, and they can be enforced in the civil court so which is very very important uh, to have patents and of course patents can be challenged so look at the countries where we have most of the granted cap per capita patent japan has the highest number okay and in this particular list you will not find india anywhere okay you will not find india in top 15 india is here you can see that the per million population what we grant patent in india is only 6 in south korea it is 2100 and the patents granted with the application israel has the highest 77% that means every application they make is granted with patents and in india it is only 18% so that means who writes the patent how it writes is very very important so you see uh, in the researchers per million in r&d india is only 156 look at usa and china and look at the companies because we also would like to know which companies are so tata motors sun pharma mahindra and mahindra lupin dr reddy's all these companies are spending a lot in in patent or even the reliance industry so yes and if you look at the I, 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 academia i did this uh, job for 2017 database you will see ict iit csr lab amity drdo velotech etc etc you will find ict mumbai is the best performing institute in terms of patent filing and application okay so 
the the technology is a capital and this is where government has to support filing patents and acquiring patents so this is this data you know i will tell you the last thing here the, i was the first case in the university of mumbai's history to patent with the help of dst csr and nrdc in 1992 university gave me permission after a year so you can imagine and when icd became independent i used to give permission within one day so so what universities don't do and what companies do you can see that there is an uncertainty in the case of universities because there is uncertainty over basic research and they may not know the marketability of the product and sometimes the basic research can lead to spill over and some company and uh, academies unfortunately value publication more than the patents so that is a problem a lot of university are inventing inventing now in the even in india in protecting their ip rights so that is what is must you know for all universities in higher education okay so what are the other problems for university generating revenue through ipr universities must connect with industry and i am deliberately put this word local if you connect with local industries your reputation will take you outside your locality there is a large gap between the university and market missing university and industry collaboration missing policy insufficient support for encouraging spin off companies from university and missing technology transfer office tto or technology licensing office tlo which is the case in many of the american universities so we have to learn from americans in here so the challenges to university in generating revenues from ipr there is a huge gap missing collaboration with industry there is no spin off promotion policy there is no ttor and there is a missing policy there is no direct provision under the law in india so what we can do we should have technology transfer office okay so universities start with a technology transfer deals to generate revenue for the institution and funding from research program and then university can say you know set up you know technology transfer offices in india and then you have five different avenues of commercialization of academic ip through technology transfer by licensing technology transferring property rights or joint ventures or university startups now this is happening in india now this is good thing and that is why we you know went up in our ranking and through patent enforcement okay so sometimes what happens somebody you know steals your patent so you can negotiate with them instead of litigation and and make more money that is what it is so that is done a lot in uh, you know in america and there is a shift to starts up so the critical factor that enhance startup uh, success is the stability of the uh, patent tto technology transfer office like columbia university leaders in you know, support from the university like purdue university support from alumina like florida and michigan and size of available research like washington and pennsylvania these are some of the examples from usa so if you look at the 20 universities with top most startup companies in usa see mit stands number 1 you see there are all others also even university stanford university is here with 160 but 244 then after mit it is columbia then purdue you see that majority of the well known universities have you know the startups coming out of their university so the academic uh, you know uh, uh, startups for example i will give you one example this is endosite from purdue university which was acquired by novartis for 2.1 billion dollar imagine and the avexis from nationwide children's hospital and ohio state university which was again acquired by novartis for 8.7 billion dollar so this means this money goes to the university so we must have startups you know from each and every university in india another problem we have there is too much discrimination among state funded centrally funded and privately funded institutions in india and that has affected the quality of uh, this uh, and the spirit of innovation rusa and techme were supposed to overcome the barrier but there were problems also in fact rusa did not give money to icd you will be surprised you know a lot of issues with rusa and institution of eminence and nep 20 template nt implementation will be uh, will have a lot of bearing so we can see in terms of faculty recruitment uh, you know who decides the standard of education what is the qualification versus expertise what about innovative teacher researcher industrial consultant the combination is very rare 
what about aict qualifications you know um, according to me uh, can we you know abandon aict qualification if there is a good researcher faculty recruitment and autonomy cross disciplinary and fearless uh, recruitment raising the bar better than the experts on the selection committee can we do that and commitment to institute and profession and excellence is the mantra so of course autonomy will help us and leadership matters and this is where leadership and dissemination of vision mission goals you can see that all these things uh, you have management they have institution head then the team leader then in the you have resource support operational autonomy fairness you have co determination you lead by example you are you are dedicated you have clarity of thought you are open and you communicate that is what is required so sometimes you know leaders we go to cricket and so you can say a good leader is committed to excellence so i gave this example of mahendra singh dhoni but sometimes that spirit so here the institutions are bigger than individuals but leadership matters the most and you must know this the india has been in australia when leading players were unavailable because of injury and all this is you see you know this team would not have been expected to win anything but they did wonders yes you can do that means you may not have the stars on your staff but you can do it provided you are committed and that is what i said in the very beginning so do not underestimate yourself so leadership leader can make or break the system set new goals perhaps unachievable and you know to the critics leader must lead from front and leader must judge every moment so what happens so we have inspiration inspirational leaders who are competent and bold and people of high integrity they are visionaries they look beyond the walls they set examples okay so the leader in academic world he has to be a tallest and most accomplished to inspire in terms of his academic achievement teaching research administration selfless service promotion of anger colleague and rescuing colleagues at the time of difficulty and not credit taker but blame owner that is what will inspire you know people okay so the leader is either a superman or super woman okay there is a 24 by 7 job taking decisions and executing them you must be passionate about the job recruiting superior colleagues attending meetings paying attention to sensitivity sharing credit and accessibility to all colleagues finding time for family most difficult and also peer so a leader is always under constant watch and if you are a vice chancellor you are always being watched or a leader so this is what is very very important so some of the leaders which i would like to quote here who had who made it the very first vice chancellor or director makes the most important contribution like iit you know kanpur dr pk kelkar our professor jeshi goes founder director of iit kharagpur they had the lasting impression of those institutions are you of satish dhawan and iic bangalore siena rao or apj abdul kalam okay or mm sharma or dr mashal kar you can see that so so many times you know only the success we see like the highest scorer in the history of test cricket is sachin tendulkar with so many runs average is so many but nobody know that he the leader can also fail and he he had 34 ducks and 14 test matches and 20 odi international so leader can fail it does not mean an error can be always success but nobody is indispensable and but their achievements can be surpassed so of course faculty recruitment and i told you ict as a institution you can see the leaders which we had in the past okay right starting from venkatraman and so never batter teaching and research for leadership roles when you cannot take make the difference never chase irrelevant majors of esteem which undermine teaching and research activity so leadership yes but do not underestimate or do not look overlook your teaching research and teaching that is very very important so i used to teach as a vice chancellor or do research okay so so this is leaders lead by example so this is when i was the vice chancellor you can see this is already you said in the in the introduction so i will not talk about it but also have inspirational leader like michael jackson what he said i have missed more than 9000 shots in my career i have lost almost 300 games on 26 occasions i have been interested to take the 
game winning shot and i missed i have failed over and over and over and again in my life and that is why i succeed what it means you must try you may be the star but you can fail sometimes when it matters so the best way may not deliver at the time of critical moment okay but never be afraid of failure so and of course there will be psychopont when you are a leader of the institute and you have to avoid them you have to analyze their advice many times we have seen this in india examples of vc and pro vc fighting and leaking the news to the media okay so there is a enemy within always when you see any negative uh, information in the media it is given by somebody within the system who doesn't like you okay and he wants to bring you to the disrepute because his purpose is not served because you are not serving that happens this is my personal experience as well so we have to recruit a lot of uh, talented people uh, you should not recruit your own student immediately after phd because that will lead to psychopathy and mediocrity they should be left alone let them do postdoc they can come back all faculty must have phd publication in international journals of repute attending conferences for learning etiquettes of research and networking with peers very important networking summer internship in industries nearby than elsewhere industrial connectivity um, which is must and modern methods of teaching and research must be learned by the faculty members startup companies by faculty members should be encouraged duty leave beyond routine in fact i have given duty leave of almost you know four months to one of the faculty members so it can happen so reward mechanism for the performance must be decided so this is what ict what we did with the connect industrial connectivity almost 90% faculty was consultant and all had phd in fact inspire faculty and ugc faculty recharge have we are given phd phd students one third share of the consultation goes back to the institute patent review formula formula was decided 20% to institute and 80% to the inventors startup companies and duty leave up to 100 days to all okay so this is what we did and the retirement age also i got extended to 65 plus 5 for fellows of national academy and endowment chairs so there are two former directors of csr in icit faculty and many desires from icit iit then csr okay so when you do research whether you emulate emulate or imitate or you are a capricorn or you are original so to be a original is very very important in, in doing research so what topic we should do is it a time bound is it contemporary is it a solvable problem is it basic applied local national international is it so you may have some solvable and some non solvable also sometimes you may have kite flying stupid idea but as a researcher you must have never say die attitude and you have to encourage and sometimes people have registered student are registering because they don't know what the student has done they have registered somebody okay and register x place and working at y place so so and the substandard journals you should never uh, these are predatory so you should never submit papers so research is 99% percent perception and 10% inspiration failure is temporary and as successive after that analytic as amar was saying publishing in peer reviewed journals and high impact papers and it will always tell you something it may be rejected but you learn from the rejected paper so patent publish and prosper the 3p formula and industrial interaction and placement so obviously innovation drives growth the companies that continuously innovate will create and reinvent new markets products services and business models which lead to more growth so universities must innovate and you must have this you know superior technical qualities extremely bright integrative and all that okay that we can so i had said this before so you know what us you know for example nicholas tekola tesla and thomas alva edition 278 patents 1093 patents okay so edition was pushing for a dc and tesla for ac current and ultimately tesla edison stopped him that time so these were the steve jobs and bill gates of their time okay so you can imagine this kind of thing uh, oh. Did 
Okay. So, the, so there are many new initiatives by government on India, several international programs like GAN, Vajra, imprint program, IT exemption I mentioned to you about it. And this is where the PID, you know, there are more number of PIDs in countries where there is a growth, GDP, and they add value. So now IITs are mandated to produce 20,000 PhDs in engineering. So you see, IPR is well. Look at these universities and how many patents they are sold and the, how much revenue they have generated. And this is a good model for India. And another interesting factor in this invention, at least one is a foreign inventor in so 76% of this, at least one is a foreign inventor in American university. Okay. So if you look at the individual excellence, how do you attain excellence as a teacher? I'll take only five, 10 minutes. Do you like your role as a teacher? Do you love the profession and the stream? Are, they, are you there as a choice or as a second option and always on lookout of a better job? Then you will never be a good teacher. Do you underrate teaching vis-a-vis -vis industrial or government job? Do, you, do, you, do your students respect you for your honesty, integrity, and authority on the subject? And do you think you are doing time for just to survive? As a teacher, you must ask these questions. And then only you will be a successful teacher. So the great teacher demonstrates by confidence. Teacher has always a confidence. They have life-life experience. They understand each student's motivation. They, they are people and they are not heroes. Okay, They are technologically capable. They focus on important stuff and they don't worry too much about what the administrator thinks. So, so a good teacher will have a great sense of humor. He is always smiling. He's fair and a good discipline. He's a kind, he understands and respects every student. Okay. And, and he gives incentive to rewards. He sets good examples. This is what a teacher does. Okay. So teacher, you know, this is the Ditto's taxonomy. It says declarative knowledge, what you think about non-declarative knowledge and this is where resilience and motivation matter a lot as far as teachers are concerned and what about the student do you love the course or branch of study you chose or were just supposed to accept by peers or peer, parents or peers do you work hard and prepare for the lecture a prior or you love rote learning have you challenged yourself in solving tough problem are you a team worker do you like to earn marks by hook or crook and are you a person of high integrity? These questions the student must ask themselves to be a good student. And the qualities of good student are hardworking and sincere, good at problem solving, unafraid of asking questions to the teacher, motivated to learn, supported by parents and or, or guardians, or being high integrity and punctuality. So yes, and this is where the internship comes into picture. And I've mentioned to you that internship helps students to gain experience, most companies require inter students to have experience and internship offers real life exposure. The students develop interpersonal relations. And this is one of the reasons I started this uh, integrated master's program in ICT, where alternate term is a trimester system, three terms in a year. Every alternate term, the student goes to industry. And one of the reasons was that. So this is from America, the most important quality, 66% interview in believe experience most important performance and relevant experience. This is US database, not the Indian database. And the attendance are good. So that is the college or the institute matters. Okay, that is, see that is last. What is important is performance in the interview. That means your student can be the best quality institute. And so internship, this was asked, 70, 47% employees in USA had a structured uh, internship program. And in students, 85% higher interns was a positive experience. That means internship is the best thing. And the intern must make it into a job opportunity. There are 10 different rules. Like you learn the unwritten rules of the office when you go there. Be the professional. Uh, one of their mistakes, you, you don't waste downtime, uh, under promise or over deliver. Get to know your coworkers. Be direct about what you want. Ask for feedback. Say thank you and stay in touch. Then only the industry will come back to you after you have graduated. So this is what the future of the workplace is going to be in 2030 across the world. 
that is called as emotional workplace, the physical workplace, the technological workplace, and purposeful work. So, so we are changing in this. And so in the past, we had the culture of utility. Now it is a culture of engagement. And in future, there will be a culture of meaning. Why do we go to work? How can we provide this in meaning leading to a deeper level of happiness and high productivity and deeper engagement? So you will have agile space for distributed workplace. Workplace is a center or a hybrid of physical and digital work. Right now, what we are doing is the same thing and it will be human centric design. So obviously this is going to have new job titles in future. For example, align strategies, purpose agent, active listener, soft power ascent evaluator. And so in future, there will be seven disruptive trends shipping the work that is technology, data, change in nature of career, then a cognitive artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, robotics, you know, explosion in contingent work and job vulnerable to automation. So automation is going to do a lot of these things in future. So obviously this is where the workforce is going to, the internet of things is going to, you know, uh, overwhelm many of our activities. And this is where, you know, you will have the quantified enterprise, the lightweight and mobile connection, all these things which you are doing now, you know, this because of internet of things, you know, so you have, you know, modern employee experience, you can see that I won't go into the details of this. This is just trying to tell you that IT, uh, 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 Internet of Things and artificial intelligence is going to come to our rescue in many of your academic activities. So, so future is most uncertain. So will my job exist? exist it should be exist. Continuous education and new type of training. So these are some of the things which I collected. You can see that cloud specialty app develops everything you know that but there's this will be so sustainability manager big data strategist data scientist remote specialist and somebody will be called old age wellness manager because many uh, parents are in india they are staying alone their kids are in america or somewhere else so who is looking after them so this is what ICT did. So I will I will stop uh, with a little bit of this information. ICT alumni contribute about 8% to the Indian exchequer. And we are not, not just chemical technology. We do all this, whatever is called green nano bio. And so we have a main campus, then Indian oil campus and Maradwada campus. And this was started in 2018. So these are nine program here. Integrated MTech, major chemical engineering, and seven minor chemical technology, MTech trimester, PhDs, all science and engineering. Similarly, in Jalna, same thing. And we also have added executive MTech with IID Kharagpur. So this is all new. So we have many recognition ICT got. I won't go into the details of this, but during my, my time, I did many things. Despite I was a leader, I also did not overlook my research and teaching. I used to do all those things, including consultation. So to nurture excellence, you have the four pillars which must work in tandem, that is faculty, students, support staff, and alumni. And so ICT produced 19 Padma awards. Okay, there are these superstars. You can look at Mukesh Ambani as a student of chemical engineering, or Narutam Satseria, Ambuja Simen. And these people were on our board of management. So your board of management must have celebrated people, okay? like Ashwin Dani or Madhugar Parekh of Pidilite, the, the heavy cloud company. And their size matters. You can see that I also did analysis where IIT Bombay, Delhi, you see they were in the, in the scholarly output, they're very high. But if you look at, you know, the so-called weighted average, ICT is number one. That means weighted average, ICT was always, I mean, among all subjects, ICT was number four in India. So that is why I was fighting for institution of eminent status to ICT. So India's top 150 government universities, you can see ICT is number nine here. Okay, in Maharashtra, it is shown as number two after TIFR. And you can see the, this AIRA uh, last, you know, government aided institute. You can see universities, ICT is number one. And here IIT is IIT Madras. So we got autonomy. We made purpose, you know, and we had a unique pair of chancellor and vice chancellor. So ICT is now multi-campus deemed to be in university. And it started with my talk in the public lecture, which I gave in petrochemical. 
and then we expanded higher faculty research intensive and these two additional campuses was my gift one is 500 crore and another is 400 crore so this was inaugurated by the the, the president of india okay and so this we also the bhumi pujan of marawada campus and so so my dream was to be in top 100 universities in the world in next 10 years and so to have 500 top faculty and 5000 plus students and to generate 3500 crore so this is what you know i hope my colleagues are looking at it and they will do it and so so ultimately i will go to this last slide and that is so this is also the technology which we develop this is icto in this energy center for production of green hydrogen and this will have a lot of impact on climate change and co2 mitigation and this is what the tab about the plant uh, paris account so this is what we are doing and we have got patents on the it's the solar energy molten salt and green hydrogen taking care of carbon dioxide generating methane hydrocarbons converting biomass and you can have methanol dimethyl ether all these things this is a personal contribution so it is not just academic you know this contribution but leadership contribution so the so called linear and circular economy will matter a great hydrogen energy so this we had this third branch of mtech in bhubaneswar in 2018 then in in jalna and so sometimes people ask me what the question of your legacy as an institute and person so i give this my legacy is not an empty building but filling the emptiness in a new with a new generation okay so the goal isn't to live forever but to create something that will so in in the uh, the words of bhagavad gita karma neva adhikare se ma phaleshu kadachami ma karma phale hetu ganna to sangast karna so the prognosis is unless you continue to innovate in all aspects of academic research administrative and industrial activities you will not be able to make a dent in future whether you are institute or individual so this is my research group so you already mentioned about this and so i thank all of you for listening to me on this national technology day okay so thank you very much thank you so much sir uh, we will remember the mantra of change challenge and opportunity and it was truly a very very informative and eye opening presentation thank you sir thank you so much uh, dear participants, now the platform is open for the discussion. You can have certain question answer session here. Uh, in case if you have any question to ask, you can type it into the chat box uh, for sure. Oh God, there are some 99 questions or what? what is <laughs> oh no. Okay. Uh, or else, uh, if you wish to, you can unmute yourselves. Uh, and if there is few questions, we'll take it as it's already seven. Amar Sadhav, sir, you may be knowing most of the participants, uh, so you can request one or two. Just for heck of asking the question, they should not ask. <laughs> uh, yes, that is true, sir. <laughs> so there is one question from uh, Sharad Gangwar, sir. Can the quality of education be affected by providing autonomy to educational institutions in India? Yes, 100%. And I, I told you that ICT is the best example of it. Uh, we were part of Mumbai University. Where is Mumbai University and where is ICT? It okay. In fact, in fact, the World Bank cites ICT as the best example of autonomy in India, in tertiary education. Uh, there is one more question, sir. According to you, how can the humanities be defined? Oh, you, whatever is, oh, very good question. Humanities, the, the social sciences, economics, okay, all those uh, subjects, psychology, philosophy, English, languages all those are humanities and uh, humanities must be taught including social sciences to engineering and medical graduates they must be taught in the new education policy in fact it is there so you can synthesize your own degree sometimes somebody likes something literature or art and drama so he can synthesize his degree in future 
So you may have major and minor degree and there are two minor degrees. You can do that. Or you can have from different institutions, one major degree from one institute and another minor degree from another institute. There's one more question, sir. How can we educate our faculties? Even though a lot of manipulation is done in educational system, we are discriminated by a lot of system according to their privilege in society. So aren't we selecting right candidates? Oh, this is a very good question. You know, one of the thing uh, which I mentioned in the very beginning, inclusiveness is a part because our human society, a country like India, which is very diverse, so many languages, so many customs, castes, creeds. So it is an inclusive society. So we cannot uh, have just one, only few people having the privileges. If the society as a whole, there has to be happiness, everybody must participate in the development of this nation. So obviously what he's talking about, you know, when you have multidisciplinary programs, right? That is what he's saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, how it will influence uh, higher education. Obviously, now in the national education policy, what they are talking about, there will not be unitary universities. In 10 to 15 years time, by 2035, 2030, and then 35, and then 2040, all universities should be giving education in different areas. So now the concept of cluster university, which is now introduced by UGC, that is the same. No? There are four or five different uh, colleges which are brought together to make one cluster university. So in future, it may happen. You need not have, uh, you know, uh, arts or uh, commerce in your area, but you can always have attachment with that and get the uh, feed from them. So right now what we are doing, we are calling them as visiting professors or something like that. But they can be a part uh, of that particular university because they already have a developed system. And in fact, that is what it means. It does not mean that you create additional faculty, invest money and all. No, it does not mean that. What it means, give education to all students, whatever they like. Suppose I like Marathi literature. I can study Marathi literature and still be a chemical engineer, right? That is what it means. So there is one more question. Uh, could you please shed some light on how multidisciplinary programs will influence higher education in the future and what kind of pedagogies should be developed for the same? Oh, very good question. You know, multi, the, I, I, I just now I told you what, what needs to be done, correct? I, I told you multidisciplinary programs will be developed based on your liking. And so there has to be a test, right? Aptitude must be there when you develop that aptitude, don't only you can go into that particular program. And so I, when I told you that in multidisciplinary programs, you may have one major degree and one minor or two minor or three minor degrees, right? So you synthesize your own degree. So there may be a different approach. Some of those things may be online MOOC courses. Some of them may be physical courses, okay? You go to the classroom and study where experiments are required. And somewhere you may not require experiments or this, you can sit in front of your computer and learn something. That is what is need, needed to be done. And right now we are doing, isn't it? In the last year and a half, everybody is learning through computer and many of the students have not gone to the laboratory. They are doing virtual experiments, okay? They are doing virtual experiments. Uh, so there is one more question like, uh, how should a student get rid of his addictions or also should a student concentrate on learning or on marks? Oh, I told you, no, I, I said uh, qualities of a good student. A good student is not bothered about marks. Good student is bothered about the concepts and problem solving ability is a good student. If you gather knowledge and you are not able to solve the problem, you are a bad student. And those are the guys, you know, it's like I used to say jokingly in the class, four plus five is nine, but five plus four is not nine because our reverse order was not taught in the class. 
so you cannot be like that you and there should be open ended questions in the examination not close write short note is always long note and the student omits everything and says tells the teacher pick up whatever you like and give me marks critical analysis is never done no yes sir uh there's one more question sir do you think that present educational policy changed by the current government will have an impact in grass rooted level will it be will it be stand like just in papers we talk about change in education system but there is hardly any transformation in human personality in current system no no this the policy which is which is announced is just to uh, give, addressing these problems only you know the policy which is announced but believe me the implementation part is left to the states so i am a member of this maharashtra state you know implementation committee and we prepared a document in fact that we have a meeting on 17th of june so see how do you implement this is left to the states you know it's it said very interesting it said you must give uh, lessons in your mother tongue right and today mamta banerji said we'll have english schools in throughout west bengal in every 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 village and tehsil so how does is so what it means so you are already saying that english education is better than the education given in your mother tongue no that is not the aim. you should learn english as a language you must be able to communicate but you should also learn your mother tongue the lang language of the state where you are staying that is that is required then only there will be a cohesion so 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 that the what is said about nup is not yet implemented no no government has yet implemented it it is just it is just policy has been announced the implementation will start uh yes uh, uh should i go ahead with few more questions or uh, uh i'm not repetitive it, it is okay it uh, was, yes, i yes <laughs> okay amar sadab sir do you have any question radhika ah uh, yes sir this is uh, professor thorat ah uh, Good evening, sir. Yeah, yeah. I am a student of Professor G. D. Yadav. Okay, sir. Excellent. So and, you have a question and, for him? Yeah, yeah. And it's a wonderful exposition by my guru, and uh, he has the vision. Uh, he has uh, taken it through the entire uh, possible solution to the higher education in India, and also you know the NEP and the state that they will implement the NEP 2020 policies also. So the Uh, the professor yadav coming from uh, shahu nagari you know we had lot of expectation that the uh, the kolapur area will take the lead in 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 uh, in uh, making copies of professor gd yadav you know so we are, we are, we are looking, looking looking forward to number of gd yadavs because he comes from a very highly progressive state in terms of the thought process and my heroes you know the shahu maharaj you know has 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 been one of the uh, beacon of hope for number of people, with reference to one of the question that you know the uh, the education must be spread across the length and breadth of India, <clears throat> and particularly to if you have PT participation, like you know Professor Yadav says that you know gross environment ratio. If you want to percent, everything starts at the village level. So we have sixty five percent people in the. and professor yadav epitomizes the uh, the village level education from village the success story to the new york success story so you know the, we have a long way to go and if you uh, observe what he has uh, uh, said it should inspire number of uh, people that who attended it and take a lead from what he has said every uh, is uh, worth in gold and then i hope the young generation get in Uh, focus on their strength so that the rest of the things will follow so thank you sir for your wonderful uh, thank you thank you for lecture. attending thank pastor you. i'm yeah. very happy that you could find time <laughs> this is yeah, national yeah, technology day always. i am surprised 900 odd people yeah, are yeah. attending this is a great surprise <laughs>
and 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 you you spoke well. you always do that yeah. yeah thank you thank, thank you. you so much sir for sharing your valuable feedback thank you so much yes radhika ma'am uh, uh, dr sb anekar principal of tkt varanagar he has re, he has raised his hands to ask some questions yeah yeah oh, yes. yeah by all means he is the principal of the college so why not hey dr anekar sir uh, am i audible yeah 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 good evening sir you are audible yeah yeah sir great salute to you on behalf of shivaj university all chemical engineers and academic fraternity sir thank you sir uh, we have one doubt about in a new education policy uh, mm. how the merging of uh, uh, what do you call uh, nba nac nirf any a single platform or single medium or single uh, mechanism to evaluate the institutes at different tier level tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 so we are in dilemma that in coming 5 years there will be the new education policy and how the institute should prepare to face nba nac or nirf or all kinds of Actually, accreditation you know, it's, yeah it's a very good question you know nac Thank and you. nba they are working on this actually uh because yeah. you know one formula doesn't fit all they have to you see you will have a reference the earlier reference and the new reference correct so many of the yardsticks have been changed so how do you you know earlier you know like for example uh, they said if you if you have a new nac grading at so and so uh, you will you will become autonomous okay you get a plus plus or whatever you will become autonomous now many things in that particular things are changed now so they have to redefine them and they are working on that in fact uh, they are also educating their evaluators uh, how to do it i am not sure because uh, it is not yet announced because the policy is announced and that is being implemented so obviously there will be a tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 whatever you know somewhere there will be emphasis on research somewhere will be teaching everything cannot be research and uh, uh, teaching uh, somewhere there will be innovation so obviously these are going to be so they are looking at in fact if you look at nup they don't talk anything about the iit you must have seen this nothing is talked about iit um, although uh, you know it is implemented they are, they are they are very high and all um, but so yes and then we will have the single council higher education council with different verticals the aicd may not be there ugc may not be there so there there is going to be a lot of churning uh, i i don't think it is not even presented in the parliament no this is not yet presented in the parliament it is not made into the law the higher education council so till that time we go by the old rules so we have uh, dr kt jadhav sir he also has to say something to you yeah yeah nice to see him thank you yes. thank you sir uh, good evening sir good evening how are you sir sir, sir i am fine sir we are sir really highly obliged by your presence and uh, hear you after long time sir uh, <laughs> sir your session was really excellent and intellectual sir thank you thank you for thank you with our chemical engineering fraternity always that lecture was not meant for chemical engineering it was not yeah, for everybody I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah yeah otherwise you, you, you will think that it is what no it no, was no. meant for all across yeah yeah it is it is for, yes, for all sir and sir sir so more than 800 uh, participants were there uh, for the interaction session i am very and happy really... to know huh? all yes, from sir. across the country uttar pradesh and rai bareilly and uh, what not a lot of bareilly rather bareilly yes sir yes sir college yes sir uh, sir this session was very useful for the student as well as faculty member sir uh, sir sir i would like to know about uh, please guide us how sir ict can help our colleges to organize some activities in terms of yeah, uh, academic yes sir first of yes, all sir. 
I am yes, no longer the authority of ICT. I have yes, retired. Sir. But in my individual capacity, yes, I can tell you what can yes, be sir. done. Because you remember, the uh, yes, protocol sir. has to be followed. If yes, sir. You obviously. This is the leader. You have to approach him, not me. I will not. But in my individual capacity, I can tell you that was that is what I told today. How did I do it? How what can be done? What will be the future? What was in the past? What is uh, currently being done? So this was, uh, you know, I I will write a paper on this now because yes, I collected a lot of work. So I will write a paper and publish. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir, for your constant inspiration to all of us. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, my, thank my... you, all the participants. Uh, okay, I would like to now propose the word of thanks officially. Uh, so I miss Radhika Dhanal on behalf of my colleagues, my college, and the entire community. First of all, spread my most sincere thanks to the Lord God. On behalf of my college and the entire management group here, I extend my hearty gratitude to our today's chief guest, our speaker, Padma Shri, Dr. G. D. Yadav sir, for sharing his graceful words with us in today's webinar. We are fortunate, sir, to have you here today. And in true sense, all our participants in this meeting uh, might have been inspired by your highly sparkling words, sir. Further, a big thank you to, uh, especially to all the deans, principals, directors from various prestigious institutes who made to attend this today's webinar. Uh, I'm also thankful to Dr. A.K. Gupta, Executive Director, D.Y. Patil Group, Dr. S.D. Chede, Principal, D.Y. Patil College of Engineering and Technology, Kulhapur for their continuous encouragement and support, as well as for gracing today's function. I mention my sincere thanks and gratitude to the management for its cooperation. I'm very thankful to all the participants for attending today's webinar, as well as posting their valuable views and sharing the positive feedback in the chat box instantly and spontaneously. And yes, Lord, last but not least, I take this occurrence to thank the entire R&D committee of D.Y. Patil College of Engineering and Technology to organize such an informative webinar. And also I thank the technical team for your prompt and continuous support and for all the arrangements that you have made. And finally, to everyone who have directly and indirectly involved in the smooth conduction of this program. So I declare that this webinar is over. Thank you, take care, stay safe, keep learning and growing. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you one and us. Okay. And bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.